Okay, hi, uh, my name is Derek. I'm your uh, instructor for this um, operating systems class. Um, today we're going to go over the uh, materials from um, Unit 5, uh, Chapter 9 of our textbook about the short term process scheduling. Okay, so we've got quite a few of these, so I'm going to go through with these a little bit quickly. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we're looking at process scheduling in this unit and in this chapter. So our objectives with this um, lecture is to be able to assess the performance of different scheduling policies for the short-term scheduler. Um, this is also known as the dispatcher. Um, and I'm going to be using these terms a lot. So we use uh, the turnaround time, the turnaround ratio, um, wait times, um, some other things for performance measures for these, okay? So, so you need to understand kind of what these terms are, okay? So uh, I'm going to go through, I mean, in this, I'm going to work through some examples uh, for each one of these um, scheduling policies, okay? So, I mean, you'll likely have to do some of the same sorts of things of, of simulating a scheduler by hand on some of our test questions for the class. Um, and the, the programming assignment for the fifth unit is usually for you to build one of these or a couple of these uh, uh, job schedulers or dispatchers, well, a simulation of one, basically. So we'll look at first come, first serve, round robin, shortest process next, shortest remaining time, um, highest re response ratio next, and the feedback scheduler, okay? So this is kind of a summary of all these, and, and we should hit most of these points about, um, uh, about how these different scheduling policies work, what their decision mode is, preemptive versus non-preemptive, and these other things here. So some of the, the advantages and disadvantages of each of these, all right? So the selection function is basically the thing that defines how the different policy or the different algorithm decides which process to select next, okay? So typically, I mean, you can only select among the processes that are ready to run. So at any given time, some processes might be blocked waiting on I.O. Some processes might be, um, they might not be in memory. So if you're using, um, um, like, like we talked about when we talked about processes, if you're using uh, process swapping or process suspension, uh, some of the processes might be kicked out of memory. So they're also not available immediately for scheduling. But anyway, among the processes right now that are blocked and that are in memory and ready to be scheduled, we have to decide, the operating system has to decide which to run next, okay? Um, and if, if you have a multi-CPU system, then it's really the same. It's just whenever any particular CPU on a multi-CPU system becomes ready, you know, it, 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 it's process that's currently running blocks or times out or whatever, uh, again, you have to make a, a, the, the scheduling decision using a selection function, okay? So it can be based on many different things, on priorities, on resource requirements, um, and we're, you know, we're only going to look at a few. I mean, there, there's, there's lots and lots of different variations of kind of scheduling policies that try to optimize different things in order to improve the performance of a typical computing system, so. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a couple things. We'll use these variables throughout these slides. Um, so you might want to keep track of how long in time is, um, a process is spent waiting. So you might use that in your decision about which process to select next. So for example, a process has been waiting too long, you might decide to select it. How much time it's already executed, right? So um, processes that have, that have executed a lot might be long processes, so you might want to treat them differently than processes that haven't executed very much yet. Uh, total service time, so in some context we might know or, or might be able to estimate how long in total a process needs to complete its task. So that's what the total service time is, okay? So it's not always possible to know that, um, um, so, so you might, might be able to estimate it, which might be good enough. Uh, in order to know it, you either have to have like somebody tell you up front, so the programmer who writes the program or submits the job has to tell you up front how long it's going to take, and they have to know somehow you know, how long it's going to take, that type of thing. So, so that's what the, the total service time is. Um, the decision mode specifies the instant at time uh, it, at which the selection function is exercised. Okay, so by by that I mean that there's really two categories. Um, we can so we can um, make our we can exercise exercise our selection function non 
preemptively or preemptively, okay? So um, in, in, in the, the non-preemptive case, that means that once we decide which process to run, we're going to let it keep running until it's done or, or until it blocks itself on I.O., okay? So that's non-preemptive. So, so there, you know, you're making a decision, then you give control to, to the process, and then the process decides when it gives control back. That's non-preemptive. So that can be pretty dangerous. So, so most operating systems that are interactive, like you're mostly used to, like on your laptop or your desktop or your phone, can't really use non-preemptive um, scheduling. Because if you did, if the process never returned or took a long time, your, your system would become unresponsive and, and the user wouldn't be very happy. Right? So preemptive is much more common for at least the, the kinds of operating systems that you're probably mostly familiar with. So. So at any given time, well, basically when we select a process to run, we usually just give it what's known as a time slice quantum, okay? So um, once it use, uses up its quantum, then we, so periodically we time it out. We interrupt it and return it back to the, the queue of ready processes so we can select a different process to run going forward, okay? Um So I'm going to use this set of processes and their arrival times and their service times. So this is different from the set that, that the textbook uses in Chapter 9. So I'm going to go through the same um, scheduling policies as in Chapter 9, but, we'll, but you'll get uh, to see another example um, and another outcome with a different set of processes. Okay? So all this means is that we've got, what, um, six processes in this system. This is just the name of the process. So I could have called this P1, P2, P3, or whatever. We just call it A, B, C, D, E, F. This is when it arrives in the system. So in this system, uh, time, um, time uh, passes in discrete time steps. So processes arrive on uh, positive integer time steps. So, the, so process ar A arrives at the beginning of the simulation at time zero. Uh, and then two time steps later, process B arrives and so on. And the service time is the thing I already talked about. So again, you may or may not be able to estimate this, but in this in this case, we know that that um, it's going to end up that that process four process A needs four uh, system time units to complete its tasks. So, so once it's it's executed for four CPU cycles or four time units, it'll be done. And B needs seven a um, uh, service time of seven, and so on. Okay. So notice um, the the, serv the so total service time is 25 here, okay? So on a single CPU system, if we schedule these processes and if the CPU is never idle for any time step, that means that um, the, the system is going to be active from time 0 to time 25, as you'll see. So that's one way you can check when you do these simulations by hand. Uh, if you add up these total service times, your, your simulation should take that amount of time to, to complete, basically, all right? So let's start with the with the simplest uh, first come first serve. Um, this is the simplest uh, scheduling policy. So basically, we select the process that's been waiting the longest. Okay. So this is also known as first in first out um, or a, a strict queuing discipline. So basically, we just use a queue, a queue data structure, and every time a new process arrives, we put it on the back of the queue. All right. Um, and then any. any and, and this is a non-preemptive, um, I meant to highlight that. Um, so, so in this version of it, once we select a process to run, uh, it runs till it's finished, and then we select the next process, okay? So this description here of how first come first serve works is really just a description of how queuing works, okay? So, so saying that we select the process with the maximum waiting time means that we select the process that's been waiting the longest, which also means that we select the process that's at the front of the queue now because that's the one that was first in uh, among the processes currently in the queue, so it's been waiting the longest, all right? So some attributes about first come, first serve. It favors shorter processes over longer processes. Uh, that's kind of the same thing as saying that it favors processor-bound processes over I.O.-bound processes, okay? So the reason why that is is that... Um, um, so you should understand what we mean by processor versus I.O. bound. So a processor bound process is one that doesn't do a lot of I.O. So when it runs, it can just be crunching numbers, okay? 
Um, and if you're working on like a non-preemptive uh, scheduler, that means that if it runs, um, it will run for a long time, crunching numbers, till it has to do some I.O. So that's why it's, it's similar to like a long process, okay? So when we talk about short or long processes, we're, we're thinking more like a batching system where you submit a process and it just runs until it's done, um, okay? Um, instead of, of, of this where we think about bursts of uh, a process running in bursts. Okay? So then a short process um, is, is similar to one that this I.O. bound. So one that does a lot of, a lot of I.O. means that it only executes like a few CPU instructions before it needs to get some more data from memory or, or write some more data into memory. Okay, So it's I.O. bound. So, so it only does, does a little bit before it has to, to wait for some I.O. to come to it to do some more work. Okay? So that's, that's what I.O. bound is. Um, So, for um, first come first serve, um, I didn't even show the, the the queue on here because it's very simple. Um, 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 I probably should have put this on the slide. I did this on my later slides here. But so at time when process A arrives at time zero, we just schedule it. It's going to run till time four, okay? And then at time four though, process B and C have arrived. But process B arrived first, so process B will be at the head of the queue, okay? So yeah, if you look at that, you know, so, so A arrives at zero, so it's scheduled. B arrives at two, and C arrives at four, but, but B has been waiting longest. So that will, then we'll schedule B to run. And since it's non-preemptive, B runs from four to 11. But in the meantime, while B is running, uh, it gets done at 11, but, you know, uh, you know, uh, C has already arrived at time four, but also D, E, and F have all arrived at five, seven, and nine, okay? But again, since this is first come, first serve, C came first back here at time four, so it runs next uh, for a service time of three, and then D runs because it came in next, and then E and F. So, so first come, first serve is always going to look like this, you know? First process runs till it's done, then the second process comes in and runs and so on, all right? So that's, that's all we have for first come, first serve. Um, one of the att attributes of first come first serve is that it it's much better for long processes than than for short processes. So it favors long processes, or it fa favors uh, processor bound processes as compared to I/O bound processes. And the reason why that is illustrated from this uh, figure from our textbook. Okay. So again, remember the um, uh, the the we we use the ratio of the turnaround time to the total service time. Um, so. If, if this ratio is high, that, that's just, just TR is the, the total of how long it's been waiting plus the service time, okay? So if this ratio is large, that means it's been waiting around a, a, a lot relative to uh, its service time, so how big the process is, okay? So, like, like for example, if, if process zero, W is a short process, uh, so it has a service time of one, uh, it's fine, so it runs immediately in first come, first serve. Uh, but then X arrives. But now when X is arriving, if Y arrives, it's another short process. If, if it, it arrives immediately after we start X, Y is going to have to wait around for a long time for X to finish, right? So, so when X finishes, its, it's ratio, you know, it, it started at one. It didn't wait any time at all before it started running. So it, ha it also has a ratio of one, right? Uh, but Y, you know, came in at time two, but it didn't finish till time 102, okay? So so it waited for 100, it didn't actually start till 101, so it waited for 100 time steps. So so its turnaround ratio is actually uh, 102, um, or is, is um, 100 divided by 1, right? Um so, so anyway, yeah, if you look at that then, so, so notice, I mean, the same thing kind of happens for Z. It, it's a, a large process, so, so it has to wait the same amount of time, but relative to its, its, the length of the process, waiting for 100 times is not really as big of a deal as, as the, sh the short process uh, X having to wait for 100 when it's only like this, only has to execute for one uh, time step, has a service time of one, right? So you, that's that's one reason why this this turnaround ratio is is a more important uh, um, measure of performance for the scheduling algorithm than just the um, uh, the wait time, right? So the wait wait time for a hundred uh, is not as significant if, if my process is, is a big process that runs for a hundred time steps, but a wait time for a hundred if I'm if I only need one 
unit to run um, is kind of a, a significant uh, thing from, from the point of view of that process. Okay. Um, so the, the next schedule we'll look at is known as a round robin scheduler, also known as time slicing. So really, this is the, the, a preemptive version of the first come, first serve scheduler. Okay, so by what, what I mean by that is that we're using a, first, a, a queue, so we're using first come, first serve discipline, but we add in preemption. Okay, so when we schedule a process to run, we don't allow it, 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 it won't run until it's finished necessarily. We only schedule it to run for a, a slice of time, so what's known as a time quantum. Right? And once it uses, uses up its quantum, we interrupt it and put it back on the queue. So it has to ma make its way back to the front of the queue to, before it can run another time slice quantum. Okay? So, so this is particularly useful in time sharing systems. So, so really, some version of, of time slicing or round robin is used in interactive systems always, like, um, you know, like the operating system you use on your phone or your, um, your laptop. I mean, it has to do some sort of time, time slicing or else the system might seem unresponsive if you try and run a job that runs for a long time. So, um, but um, like first come first serve, um, it's it's still the round round scheduler can still be unfair to I/O bound processes or short processes. Okay, so. Um, the reason here is slightly subtle or slightly more different, um, but but I'll, I'll talk about kind of the reason in a little bit more detail of why that is, or give a, a small justification for why that's the case. Okay. So let's look at the round robin. Uh, here here we're going to use it first of all with a time slice quantum of four. Okay, so process A arrives at time four, so it's just going to be scheduled for for a time slice quantum of four, but that means it'll be able to finish because it only needs four time slices in total. So A would run till completion. But while A is running, B arrives at 2 and uh, C arrives at 4, okay? So the, the, this down here, I'm trying to represent what the queue looks like. This is the front of the queue on the left and the back of the queue on the right. So at time 4, when A is done, we're going to make our next scheduling decision. So we'll just look at the queue. And B's at the front of the queue, so it's been waiting the longest. So we'll schedule B to run. But this, since this is a preemptive round robin, we schedule it for the time quantum of 4. So B is scheduled to run from 4 to 8, okay? And we're going to make our next scheduling decision at time 8. Um, and and so, no, so we took B off the queue, but C was still on the queue. And while B is running, um, um, C, uh, C is already arrived, but, but D arrives at time 5 and E arrives at uh, time 7, right? So then at time 8, and then B isn't done at time 8, okay? So, so, you know, C was on the queue already, D and E arrive, so, so D arrived first, so it ends up on the queue after C, then E arrives on the queue, and it's put on the queue after D. Um, and if you look carefully how the textbook does it, um, we always, um, uh, well, in this case, yeah, E arrived at time 7, so it's obvious that E is going to be on the queue ahead of B, because B doesn't finish until time 8, okay? But um, in some of the examples from the textbook, there, there are examples. So, for example, if, if, B, if we had a time quantum of 3, and if B ran from like 4 to 7, um, and its time slice quantum was up at time 7 at the same time that um, um, E arrived, um, the textbook always puts the process arriving first, and then um, it times out the process and puts it on after, okay? So that, that's usually not a concern in a real system because it's, it's, you really can't get simultaneous things like that to happen in a real system. There's always going to be something down at the discretization level of the circuits that cause one or the other to happen first. But, but in a simulation like this, you have to kind of worry about kind of things like that, right? So at time 8, we have this situation then. So this is our queue, and then the decision set, uh, the, the selection function is always just take the process at the front of the queue. So, so again, we'll, we'll select C to run for four time slice quantums. Um, these numbers above here, I forgot to mention, that's, that's the amount of time remaining that each process has, okay? So notice when B came back on the queue, it still has three time slice, you know, three time steps that it needs to run here. 
So C, when it arrived, only needs a total service time of three. So even though we schedule it for a time slice quantum of, of four, um, it ends up being done at time 11, okay? So it, it finishes at time 11, um, and, but while C was running, um, F arrived. So, so uh, here at time 11, we, we still had D, E, and B on the queue, um, and, and F arrived, right? And B, D, E, and F haven't run yet. B did run. It still has three remaining here. <laughs> All right. And then you keep doing that. So, so now at time 11, we're going to schedule D for four time slice quantums, but it only has two, uh, a service time of two. It only, it only needs two more time steps. So it gets done at time 13. So now time, nothing arrived, and, and, and D didn't get put back under the queue. So at time 13, we just have E, B, and F on there. So at time 13, E gets scheduled for four time slices, and it, it has a total service time of five. So, so it's, only, it's not going to use up all, it's not going to be finished at that point. So it'll time out at time um, 17 and get returned back to the end of the queue. Um, and then at time um, 17, B will get scheduled. It'll finish up its last three time quantums. Um, and then I didn't show the Q anymore, but yeah, and then, then F will get scheduled after B is done um, for four, a time slash quantum of four, and it'll finish up, and then finally E will be done, okay? So if you do these things by hand, you need to, to keep track of that information and do it something like that, right? Uh, although one kind of note, um, you know, if you're doing these tests and you have to write these out, uh, it's sufficient to give me a schedule like this rather than trying to draw out like a, a, a timing diagram like this of some kind. So. Um, all right. So um, I should maybe go through, um, I'll go through this a little bit quicker here, so I won't uh, spend quite as much time on it. So, so we're doing the same thing with the same processes, but we use a time slice quantum of one, okay? So, so I don't show the first two times. I mean, A arrives at time zero. It gets scheduled for one time slice quantum. So it times out, goes, returns to the queue, but the queue is empty. Nothing has arrived. So it's, it gets scheduled again. Um, and, uh, here, and here's an example of what I was talking about, how the textbook handles this. So at time two, B arrives. So at time two, uh, we handle the process arrivals first. And, and, and when you do the simulation um, of the scheduler for the, for the class, you should handle simultaneous arrival and time out in the same way, okay? So at time two, since B arrived, it gets on the queue first, and then A times out, and it gets put back at the end of the queue. Um, and A still has two left um, because it had a service time of four, uh, but it used two up of those. Um, and, of course, B hasn't run yet, so it has a seven. Okay? So at time two, we will schedule B to run, um, and, and it will time out. So at time three, then, you know, A is at the front of the queue, B is back at the end, and B has six to go. Okay? So then we will schedule A for a time slice quantum. So that gives us to time four, okay? So at time four, um, you know, B was on the queue, C arrived, so, so C ends up behind B because we process arrivals first, and then A times out, um, and, and A has one left now, right? So now B will run, and I think I'm going to stop kind of going through this. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to verify the rest of these here, right? But, but yeah, when you're doing, using a small time, time slice quantum like this, you'll see something like this. It, 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 it jumps around to all the processes and, and runs them kind of round robin like this. So. Um, okay, yeah, that was the end of the, the simulation there. So, so um, kind of an answer to why... Um, um, Round robin scheduler can be unfair to I/O bound processes or short processes. So, um, if you're building a um, a time slicing system, uh, it's important that they, so one important parameter to tune is the is the the size of your time slice quantum, right? So, so your performance can be really bad if you set your time slice quantum incorrectly. So ideally, you want your time slice quantum to be basically about the same um, as what a typical burst, what's known as a burst time is. So what, however long usually processes run between when they start to when they need I.O., 
that's your burst time. So if you can calculate that average burst time, you want your time slice quantum to be that, or a little bit bigger. So in that way, because, because if it's too small, you get this kind of, so if your quantum is too small, smaller than your typical burst time, uh, the, the, the process will, will run, um, and um, it will um, uh, get interrupted Uh, so, uh, so the same thing happens if it's too big as well, right? So uh, the the idea is that if, if it's if it's just slightly too small, you end up running it, and then when you run again, it only runs a little bit before it has to do some I/O. So so for an I/O bound process like that, um, uh, it, then it, it it'll end up not using up its full time slice quantum, okay? Right? So that's why it's unfair to I.O. bound processes. So, so lots of times when it doesn't use up its full time slice quantum, um, it's not making as much use of the CPU as a, a process that's processor bound that always uses up all of its time slice quantum. Okay. Um, so... The textbook uh, gives one uh, example, you know, so there's different ways you could try and correct that imbalance, to try to make it a little bit more fair to I.O. bound processes. So virtual round robin is something that, that has been used and it works to, to, to make it a little bit fairer. So the basic idea on virtual round robin is that if a process gets blocked for I.O., um, of course, you know, so it'll get interrupted, um, um, and it might still not, it might have some more time left on its quantum, so it hasn't used up all of its quantum, and then when it gets done with its, um, you know, when it's, when its I.O. completes and it becomes ready, we don't put it back onto the ready queue, we put it onto a different ready queue called an auxiliary queue, um, and the auxiliary queue has highest priority, so if there's anything on the auxiliary queue, we always select it. So, so notice then, uh, so, so things that were I.O. bound end up on the auxiliary queue, but since we have higher priority, um, uh, we'll be selecting them in preference to processor bound things that time out and get returned to the regular ready queue, okay? But an important thing about this, so, so that, if, if we just did it like that, it, it might be unfair for I.O. processes, so it would just keep doing I.O. processes, maybe even starving out um, processor-bound processes, okay? So if you take something off the auxiliary queue, we don't schedule it for a full time slice quantum, we only schedule it for the remaining time slice quantum that it had when it got interrupted, okay? So in that way, I.O. bound processes, even though they get interrupted in the middle of quantums, they, they, they get kind of like two, scheduled twice so they can use up their whole quantum. Right, so that that's kind of the idea of how virtual round robin works. Um, okay, so um, that's going to be the end of video one here. So I'm I'm, I'm splitting it up in two videos because this is a good place to stop. So uh, at this point, when we've looked at uh, round robin um, and and first come first serve, that's a basic type of queuing mechanism. So, so all, both of those have just used a queue. Okay. So the the next ones that we'll look at in the next video, we start using some more complicated um, decision mechanisms uh, for selecting which process to run next. Okay. So, so I'll stop there, um, and then I'll see you in the next video.